Great. And um, okay. perfect. Well, welcome, Sounds everybody. Like a welcome to our, our little webinar here. Uh, we have a very special guest with us, Dr. Lexman Baru, who's uh, George Washington University. And uh, thanks, Doctor, for being with us. Thank you, Brian, for making this happen. Brian Kalfas from Acadia Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're going to talk about Mar Parkinson's disease more than motor symptoms. Doctor, I'm going to let you take it away. Perfect. Sounds like a plan. Okay. So it's my pleasure to be here, folks. Uh, I hope everything's going well today. We're having a little bit of a rainy day in D.C., uh, but aside from that, it's my pleasure to talk about Parkinson's disease more than motor symptoms. Um, and Brian, hang on. Valerie's trying to get a hold of me. I'm, I don't know why, but you may want to just address it. So we're going to talk about more than motor disease. And I'd like to thank Acadia as well as Brian for making this happen, along with Carl setting up the links. So uh, I appreciate everyone's efforts. And so this is an exciting topic because many times I'm talking about much more of the things along the lines of motor symptoms in Parkinson's. So it's nice to talk about non-motor symptoms, which can sometimes be as vexing as the motor symptoms. I'm at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. I'm a residency program director there, an associate professor, as well as a movement disorder specialist. I am speaking on behalf of Acadia Pharmaceuticals and I'm being compensated for my time and effort. So I'll be able to speak to questions that will talk about uh, Parkinson's disease, hallucinations, delusions, and I would recommend that when we do get to questions, keep the questions general so your protected information stays protected. And the questions I would address are more in terms of information and less in terms of medical decision-making since I don't have a license to practice outside of DC, Virginia area. And your healthcare professional who knows your medical condition should be able to discuss those issues with you. So let's talk about the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, specifically hallucinations and delusions. And let's, we'll talk about how these are impacting you. What do, they, what do the individuals experience? How are they impacted by them? And then how can you talk to your healthcare provider to establish a treatment plan? In this, you'll hear from other patients as a testimonial of what symptoms they have and what their, what their experience has been as well. So if you look at it, let's talk about what exactly is Parkinson's and how do delusions and hallucinations occur to you? About a million individuals in the United States have Parkinson's. Most common symptoms of Parkinson's that are motor or tremor, rigidity, slowness of movement, or balance difficulty. Those are the things. And once upon a time, they may have started with one symptom and then gradually added on. They may have started on one side of the body and then gradually added on from there. But for the most part, that's the situation that people have experienced. And of course, if you look at the non-motor symptoms, many times they may start out early on with Parkinson's and gradually build over the course of time. Some of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's um, can be uh, issues with constipation, decreased sense of smell, uh, issues with restless leg symptoms, talking in your sleep. But many times over the course of time, the, the non-motor symptoms can accumulate and become just as bothersome, if not even more bothersome than the motor symptoms. The two symptoms we're going to talk about are hallucinations and delusions. So it's important we define those. Hallucinations are seeing, hearing, or experiencing things that don't exist. So if I look outside, I'm looking at a blank wall and I start seeing things there, a person there standing in front of me, or I start hearing noises that are there, that I, then, I'm not, then I'm having a hallucination because it's something that I'm experiencing or sensing that's not really there. Delusions are more mental in the sense that they are believing something that does not, is not real or there's evidence to the opposite. For example, if individuals may have odd beliefs about somebody harming them, somebody trying to send messages to them, somebody trying to steal from them, etc. So those are delusions. And they're usually fixed, as in they occur over and over again. Where hallucinations may change typically from one hallucination to another. Now, there can be many causes for hallucinations and delusions. Many times the first time individuals develop them, it may be the setting of dehydration maybe in the setting of an infection. Those are two common things. <clears throat> As we head into the winter season, people tend to have more issues with infections. People tend to have more issues with other medical conditions. So if something else tips the balance, people will tend to have hallucinations. In fact, the first time it occurs ever, the thing to do is to look for other causes. Is there dehydration? Has a medication been added or changed or stopped? Has there been an infection? Has there been something else health-wise that's changed? In, in, if it has, then that has to be managed. If it's not, then by definition, it's Parkinson's related. 
Now, Parkinson's medications can certainly cause it. Hallucinations can also be caused by people who may drink, who may be heavier drinkers. And also dimmer light time. And this is, of course, the peak time. We're heading towards the getting darker and darker till we get to December 21st, which is the longest night of the year. So we are getting into that dim light, late fall, uh, early winter season, which is, which is where hallucinations tend to occur a little bit more. So again, important to discuss these issues with your healthcare professional, but also at the same time discuss what has changed recently as well. If hallucinations have occurred all of a sudden, going from no hallucinations to sudden hallucinations occurring, then by definition, there's another cause and we have to be able to find it typically. But it also at the same time tells me that somebody's more prone to that, that it may develop in the setting of Parkinson's. So here's a great example of an early hallucination. Early sort of. It's not a true hallucination, but it's an illusion. You look at something and it looks like something else. We've all had that here and there. You see a speck of dirt on the floor and you think it might be a bug. We look at something on, on, the, on the wall and we look again to see, did we see that? No, it was something else that looked like it. So here's a balled up sock that looks like a mouse. Uh, people will complain that, that you know, the noodles look like worms. Um, people might complain that snakes, uh, belts look like snakes, things along those lines. So something that looks like something else. And here's what hallucinations can be. It can be a variety of different things. Most typically in Parkinson's, they're visual. You're seeing them. But sometimes people may feel something crawling on them and it's not there. Or tasting things or smelling things that aren't there. Or hearing things. Or just feeling an internal body sensation that's not there. That has been investigated and evaluated. But seeing is by far the most common. I would say probably 70, 80% is seeing things. Fewer are, are reported elsewhere. Here's another great example of a hallucination, a pleasant one in this case. A, 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 an elderly man looking into the water. He sees two kids playing with him. They're obviously not there next to him, but he sees them. So this is an example of a visual hallucination. Delusions can come in different forms. They can be persecutory. Somebody's trying to harm you, steal you, threaten you. Jealousy, where somebody is cheating on you, your partner's cheating on you. And reference, where you feel like messages are being directly communicated to you. News is a big component of this. When people hear the news, they hear bad news on, on the news specifically about war or issues with regards to a, a shooting. They believe that the killer might be out to shoot them. They might be concerned that the war is occurring and coming to their house or that it's going to impact them. <clears throat> so there's messages. And here's an exact example of delusions. Somebody that believes, excuse me, that that somebody's outside in my neighborhood looking for me or somebody's spying on me. So they're constantly looking at the door, looking outside the window. A uh, great example was a couple of uh, weeks ago, it was raining very heavily uh, in the greater DC area. The next day, um, a patient of mine who I've known for about eight, nine years came in with his spouse and his spouse said, you know, last night at two o'clock, he woke up and went outside in the rain with an umbrella because he thought people were throwing stones at the window. It's like I could not convince him that it was the rain making that noise, um, which it was, and there were no people. But he went outside looking at a flash, taking a flashlight to see if there were people throwing stones. And that's an exact example. He didn't see anybody, but he was convinced there was somebody throwing stones at the window and making all that noise. So that's an example of a delusion again. And symptoms progress over the course of time. And I think that's incredibly important for folks to know that. Um, they may start out early on with these illusions, these one-off things. And you may go tell your healthcare professional, and they may tell you, keep an eye on it. But at some point over the years, they will progress. They go from being milder symptoms to becoming more prominent, becoming more involved. And at the same time, they start to become more impactful for individuals. And as that happens, uh, the issue is, of course, um, the challenges. And the challenges are that the individuals start living in a different life um, and trying to get them to interact with you while they're interacting with someone else or other things and they're preoccupied by their own internal stimulation. And that becomes a bigger challenge. So many times this may be starting out, it's a good time to notify your neurologist who's taking care of it and then go from there to being able to... Um, treat it if it becomes as it becomes a bothersome issue but not waiting till somebody's completely involved in their delusions now it's important to understand what hallucinations and delusions are they are not dementia 
and they're not vivid dreams. Many times people will complain about vivid dreams because hallucinations occur at nighttime. It's a very simple way to differentiate vivid dreams. If the person is asleep and talking in their sleep and moving around, then they're having vivid dreams. The person's awake and seeing things while they're awake. That is a hallucination. And hallucinations and delusions do not necessarily mean that you have dementia or you have Alzheimer's or other things. But it's important to understand that this is a coexistent situation due to Parkinson's and progressive Parkinson's. So many times just come to your healthcare provider rather than trying to put a label on it. Tell them what's going on. He or she is seeing mice, and I have never been able to find mice. We put traps down. There are no tra there are no mice caught in traps, but he sees mice all the time. That's a great example of a hallucination. Or so and so says he's always, you know, swatting away at bugs, <clears throat> and we don't have bugs in the house. I've bought bug spray. We've had bug lanterns. Nothing ever gets caught realistically, but he's always seeing bugs. So the proof is to the contrary. Over the course of Parkinson's, over the two to three decades of time, the individuals with Parkinson's will have it. About half the individuals may develop it at some point in the course of their disease. Many people think it might be due to med the, the medications and other things. We believe now that there's a chemical in the brain called serotonin, which may play a role in the hallucinations and delusions. And the folks that are higher risk for developing it are individuals that have older age. They have more severity of their Parkinson's, they have longer history of Parkinson's. They may be on more medications, but these are the individuals that we all, we query. And we query people that have had Parkinson's for five years or so to, to kind of establish that as a screening thing for everybody, and especially individuals that are older, five years. So we get an idea of how they're doing in terms of their Parkinson's, but we don't want this to go unaddressed. And many times it can go unaddressed because, um, they're not able to um, have these issues in the same way. So they're able to have more and more of these problems that occur in setting. Now, let's go to the next one. So if you look at the issues with regards to um, hallucinations and delusions, a lot of these individuals will end up in the hospital. Why? Because they make bad decisions because of hallucinations and delusions. Hallucinations may cause them to trip or fall. Hallucinations may cause them to, to get injured. Delusions may cause them to get injured. They're a more vulnerable population, and if they, and they may end up in the hospital because family members are not able to take care of them anymore because the family members have fights with them, not necessarily physical, but emotional and in a tug of war, basically because they're not able to manage the symptoms. And many of these individuals end up in facilities. If you look at hallucination delusion management, well, there's non-drug management first. Let's talk about those. Some of that is you know, getting rid of the shadows. Shadows are a big component. When you see shadows, they can really throw you for a loop. They can create problems for you because they may act like something else. So if you see a shadow, just like how children will complain about shadows looking funny and causing them concern, same thing, a shadow here can be misinterpreted as an animal or a person. So putting in lights and brightening the lights, reducing the shadows is important. Sometimes it may be helpful for the family to have a discussion what this is and how to best manage it. Many times opposing the person is not the absolute important thing. You, the goal of family members who are kind of, you know, find it difficult to accept this is to oppose it and challenge them. And sometimes that leads to confrontations. So that may be helpful as well. Then there's, of course, medication treatments and medication options may be to adjust medications. They may be on other medications that can promote hallucinations. There's a variety of medications that can do that. So it's discussed with your healthcare professional and your doctor, your neurologist who can tell you what the medications should be and if which medications could be causing it. Parkinson's medications can also sometimes create hallucinations and maybe if appropriate, a dose can be adjusted on that. And again, that's a conversation to have with the person managing your Parkinson's. So all important issue is one, to be aware of the symptoms of hallucinations, delusions that can occur with Parkinson's. Um, and then the next step is to be able to um, have the plan of action of how to discuss this with your healthcare professional, how to discuss it as a family, and then three, how to be able to manage it. So there's really four components of it, recognizing the symptoms, being able to have that conversation with your loved one who may be experiencing it and other family members, having a conversation with your, your healthcare professional, and then creating a plan of how to implement it. So it's interesting. Most people, a lot of people don't talk about this with your healthcare professionals. And the reason they don't is because 
one, they don't think it's part of their Parkinson's. My Parkinson's is my tremor, my rigidity, my slowness of movement, my balance, but not this. Two, they're concerned that some of the things that the loved one will say may seem outlandish. And imagine if, you, if you're a healthcare professional and you hear from a person with Parkinson's that their spouse is cheating on them or their children are stealing from them or some combination of things that you may not want that information out there, even if it's untrue, because there's a chance that the healthcare professional may believe it. So it's important to discuss this up front with them. And then the next thing, of course, is the issue with regards to the fact that sometimes people are afraid that they might be locked up or taken away. They might be committed. So many reasons to stay silent, not understanding their symptoms, not being able to express it, not linking them to your Parkinson's disease so you don't know where to turn to, not being able to bring it up because of shame or just being embarrassed by this. And last but not least, being afraid that the treatment might be worse than living with those symptoms. And this is peak time for developing hallucination solutions in our clinic because of the darker lighting and the, and the, and the shorter daylight hours, but also because family members are getting together for the holidays. So if somebody's been having hallucinations and the spouse has kind of just been sweeping it under the rug, well, when families meet and they stay together for the holidays, people will bring it up, people will see it and they'll bring it, they'll, add, they'll ask them to bring it up at the next visit. So we get to hear about it you know, in throughout between Thanksgiving time well into February, because family members will notice and say, no, this needs to be addressed. So if you ha are experiencing it, or if a caregiver notices you, bring this up to your healthcare professional, discuss it. Like I said, there's three people in that relationship, caregiver or family, the person who's having these symptoms, and the healthcare professional. And it can impact your life, because your, your loved one with Parkinson's is now experiencing a whole different variety of symptoms that are not being able to be managed. And many times they're not interacting with you, even though that's important, but they're interacting with something that's not real. So educate yourself about the hallucinations delusions, discuss them with your family member, then discuss them with your healthcare professional and see what is my plan of action, whether it's to adjust medications, look at medications, look for other causes of it, reduce the medications or treat it. So sometimes it follows kind of a neat pathway of things that have to be done. But all of this begins with earlier earlier discussion on this. Because if you don't do an early discussion on this, almost invariably, all those steps have to be done, but they have to be done when things are really bad. So again, just a summary, visual hallucinations are the most common. 50% of the individuals may develop them over the course of their disease. And remember, that course of the disease is two decades, three decades of Parkinson's. And over the course of time, they may have worsened. So it's important to have that discussion with each other and with your family, with your healthcare professionals to establish a plan of care. If there's nothing else you take out of this discussion, these four points are incredibly important. Now let's switch gears to talking about a medication that is approved for hallucinations and delusions in the setting of Parkinson's disease psychosis, which is Nuplazid or Pima Vastrin 34 milligrams. Remember that when we talk about Nuplazid, all antipsychotic medications have a boxed warning, which says there's increased risk of death in elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis. It's important to understand that, remember we said hallucinations in the setting of Parkinson's are not necessarily dementia, and it's important to understand that. But because it's a it's a antipsychotic, it has a boxed warning, and your doctor can discuss that in more detail when the time is right. Nuplazid is the only FDA-approved medication for Parkinson's disease psychosis, the hallucinations and the delusions. And the way it works is that it works on a different pathway in the brain, pathway of the chemical called serotonin, which we've learned over the years, over the last decade plus, that this is the chemical that's responsible for the hallucinations and delusions that occur. That previous to that, we used to believe that it was due to dementia, or we used to believe that it was due to the dopamine medications, and that's not necessarily accurate that there are more than one factor causing it, and serotonin chemical in the brain changes can do that. In a study where individuals took Nuplazid versus those who did not, the ones that took Nuplazid had fewer hallucinations and delusions, and fewer means fewer in terms of number, less severe, less realistic appearing. And a portion of patients did not experience any hallucinations or delusions after they started taking Nuplazid for six weeks. So, you know, some cases it's important to understand that going on the medication will take a little bit of time. It can take four to six weeks to start noticing the full effect of it. And that's another important reason to have that discussion and begin treatment sooner rather than when things are, things are really bad. So when somebody comes to me first, we talk about getting testing to look for other causes. If the other causes are there, 
then fixing an infection with your primary care doctor, dehydration or adjusting medications is the right call. But if there's no obvious cause found for it, we go ahead and we'll treat it or adjust medications. But it's important to understand that this may take several weeks to get to that point. And always talk to your healthcare professional if you're planning to discontinue a medication. Nuplazid was studied in Parkinson's population patients. We saw a reduction in hallucinations and delusions, but we also did not, we also did not impact the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And I think that's incredibly important because many times medications that are used to treat psychosis can worsen the motor symptoms in Parkinson's. Nuplazid does not. In fact, individuals can take their regular carb levo and Parkinson's medications just the way they have been because it works on a different chemical in the brain. Now, side effects. Again, the two most common side effects I bring up are right up front, which is swelling of the arms and legs and nausea. And there may be other issues that some people might experience, such as constipation or confusion. But I often warn people about the top side effects. And I always tell them to monitor it. We typically have them take Nuplazid once a day with food. And that's incredibly helpful. Now, who should not take Nuplazid? Well, the most important reason is if you're having an allergic reaction, you should not take Nuplazid. If you've had a Nuplazid before and had an allergic reaction, then do not, do not take that. The second is the issue with regards to anybody who has a bad heart rhythm because Nuplazid can interact with some of the medications that are responsible for maintaining heart rhythm. So if you have an abnormal heart rhythm or if you have something called a QT prolongation, a cardiologist would know what that is. And if you have a cardiologist for a bad heart rhythm, ask them if you can go on Nuplazid. If I ask somebody and they tell me they have a bad heart rhythm, I have them con connect with their cardiologist before starting this medication because a cardiologist is aware of the medication and its impact on other medications, specifically heart rhythm medications. Again, very important before you start taking a new medication, always tell your healthcare professional if you have any other medical issues. Always make sure they are aware of your medications. So many times I'll go through the list of medications and say if there's anything to change. You want to tell them up front if there's a medication interaction that's going to be there. Your healthcare professional can easily check to see if there's any supplements or other things that you're putting in that can interact with this. The Placid is a 34 milligram capsule. It can be taken once a day with or without food. I typically tell people to take it once a day with food. And how you are able to get that medication is going through a program called Acadia Connect, which is basically a hub that works with your doctor's office. Your insurance connects with you and delivers the medication. So it does four things. It receives the prescription from the doctor's office. It works with your insurance to get approval. It gives you copay assistance based on your qualifications and then ships the medication to you. So it does all four of those things. Just a summary of the new Plazid portion before we open up to questions is that it is the only FDA approved treatment for hallucinations and delusions. In a study, individuals who took Nuplazid had less severe, less frequent hallucinations than those who did not. And again, many times I define response as less frequent hallucinations, less severe hallucinations, less vivid, less realistic appearing. And the study did not have any, improve, any worsening of the motor symptoms, which is good because you can keep the medications that treat your Parkinson's motor symptoms separate from the ones that are treating your delusions and hallucinations. The most common side effect we talked about was nausea and swelling of the arms or legs. And that's important to monitor. And I usually tell folks when they start taking it to monitor it. And remember, it takes about four to six weeks for Nuplaza to work. So people monitor those symptoms, but they're also monitoring for improvement as well. I'm going to play this video, which does not seem to want to play. Okay. Let me see if I can play this. Perfect. I'm Diane Sagan. Um, I live with my husband, Jay, who has Parkinson's disease. We met in art school in San Francisco many years ago. We've been married 51 years and have a beautiful daughter named Kari. And we've had a wonderful life together to this point. We have a lot of challenges, but we're quite happy. We moved into this house in 2009 and after a little while I began noticing he would talk about seeing things on the periphery of his vision. He began seeing black cats and they would kind of run past him. At that point we thought, oh my gosh, what is going on? 
when Jay began having hallucinations and delusions, we went to his neurologist and explained what was going on. And he explained to us that this is an aspect of Parkinson's disease psychosis. There are so many things that go along with it. Definitely there's a paranoia. He gets worried that somebody's accessing our money through the computer. That's not me. He also doesn't believe that I'm me very often. He will walk up to me and say, where's Diane? And he will say, can you please call Diane and let her know I want to talk to her. And so I'll call myself and he'll talk to me. And um, strangely, we can have fun with that. It's not all bleak, but it's kind of scary. You just wonder how far it will go. Day-to-day -day life has changed immensely. The physical things with the Parkinson's are easier to deal with than the psychosis. We both were forced to retire, and I basically need to be with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I cook all the meals. He did have to quit driving. I now handle all the finances. I pretty much do, do both of our lives. Yeah, I do miss the way things were, but we do the best we can with what it is. I wanted to share our story because I want other people to understand that there is such a thing as Parkinson's disease psychosis. You know, I think people need to realize there are plenty of other people going through this. Every time I hear a story from somebody else who is experiencing the exact same thing I'm experiencing it is uh, astonishing and it makes me feel a lot better, you know, knowing that I'm not alone. I'm going to play one more video. Sorry, I don't know why the two videos were playing together. I hope it didn't cause confusion. No problem, doctor. Sure. And these are great videos that give you a patient perspective. Yeah. You guys can hear the volume, correct? Yes. When the hallucination began, it felt so real to her that they did not even seem like hallucinations. We didn't know what it was, if it was real. It was very believable. She really believed that there were, you know, people like in the clothes tree in her room, or she really believed that people were doing Tai Chi in the backyard at 6 a.m. or there was like, like something under the bed. It felt very real and there's no talking somebody out of that. And then eventually over time it started becoming a very frightening to her because of my mom being a nurse. It was very difficult for her not to be able to help her and it hurt her and I noticed that right away. It was really scary for everybody if anyone has a loved one with Parkinson's disease that's experiencing hallucinations and delusions, they should really talk to their doctor. She's just an incredible person. Such a great outlook on life. Spending all that time with her has really just shaped me to be who I am, I think. And I don't know, I just love her so much. So these are great examples of what patients will experience and family members will experience with hallucinations, delusions, the impact it causes on them. It is, in many ways, I will say that this really is a change in the stage of your Parkinson's in that sense. It, it brings about new challenges for many individuals, both the person who has them and the, the caregivers around them. It's important to understand that the, the person has many more challenges in that situation. And sometimes it requires an adjustment in the life as you mentioned, one, uh, one spouse mentioned that she uh, stopped, they stopped working. This was a time to retire and to devote time at home. Um, may need more care at home. Um, some family members will move in with their children, whereas they were living near their children beforehand in that sense. So there's a, this, this brings about a big amount of transitions in many ways. Yeah. So I talked about some of the summary points. And before we go to questions, I think some of the more important things to talk about are 
have this conversation early. If you're noticing this, bring it up to your healthcare professional, bring it up to the other family members, bring up the discussion up front because that gets the ball rolling on. What studies do we need to go through? Are there medications that could be causing it? Is there infection? What's going on? And then at the same time, begin the discussion about possibly treating this uh, earlier than later because we know over the course of time it progresses. We talked about the medication option, which is FDA approved, which is to reduce the hallucinations delusions without worsening the motor symptoms of it. We talked about the side effects of it, how to be able to get it. But again, it begins initially with recognizing it and having that conversation with your healthcare professional. Absolutely. Thank and you. Actually go here and leave it at questions. Are the questions going to be in the chat? Yes, yes. Um, so first of all, doctor, I really appreciate you joining us today. Um, folks, for anyone out there who has questions, please put them in the Q&A or the question and answer box, chat box. Um, I just, if you don't mind, I'd like to add one comment uh, just to piggyback on what you have talked about uh, so eloquently today, beautiful presentation. Um, after doing this as a practitioner, therapist, trainer, movement specialist for many, many years, working with countless people with Parkinson's, uh, the one thing that I would like to advise others in my profession and, and others outside of my profession to be aware of is that because we know that people who are living with Parkinson's are already at a higher risk of falling and the complications from falls are our number one cause of mortality, basically, as last I, I knew. Uh, we don't we want to keep people out of the faller category. And I've had it happen occasionally where somebody they can seem totally fine when I'm with them, and then all of a sudden, and this one particular example is I went to an assisted living facility to do a house call, basically. About a half an hour in, this gentleman with Parkinson's. All of a sudden, starting having a hallucination that the Germans were outside. And he pulled the curtain and he looked, and there they are with the guns. Of course, they're not there, but they were there for him. And then he he started moving and wanted to move quickly away from the window. This I caught him on his way down in a fall because I don't want any falls mm -hmm. on my watch. But this can increase the likelihood of falling, and oh, absolutely. we don't want that to happen. So. I just wanted to make that comment because it's so important. And, and I think there's several things in that story that are good educational resources for everybody. One, when hallucinations occur, they're very personal. No, no doubt this gentleman probably served in World War II. He did. That's one. Yep. Two, two, this person saw something that terrified the heck out of him. Mm -hmm. Three, he made bad decisions based on that. And imagine if you saw that in reality, you would make quick decisions and you may stumble and you may fall. And that may occur for somebody who does not have Parkinson's, but have an elderly individual with Parkinson's doing that. You can make bad decisions with this. And one of the, that, and, and other bad decisions we've done, it, it, people have done is they'll, they might have a knife and they might use that knife and they're starting to wield that knife. And they could injure themselves, injure their loved ones in the setting of this. So there's a whole bunch of changes that have to be done if this is, you know, we, if this is where you want to be able to move them away from firearms and knives and sharp objects in that sense. Absolutely. Because the concern is about harming themselves, harming other people, becomes very, very realistic. This is where if you have been driving, maybe driving, no longer driving in that situation, because imagine if you're driving and you see a hallucination, you can easily injure yourself, injure the car person or others in the street. These become very major. This, when I said this was a state change in Parkinson's, I really meant it's a state change in Parkinson's. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just looking to see if we have any questions in our chat or in the q and I pulled up the chat as well. Yep. I don't see any. Um, any questions out there, folks? Well, we have uh, the doctor on with us. And again, I uh, really so much appreciate your time and your wisdom and your knowledge, experience coming you know, with this great presentation, really saying so much and so little time to teach us because um, you know, I'm very aware of these things, but I always learn and I just learned more. You know, the, 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 the idea of a personalized experience with a hallucination is, right. uh, yeah, it, you know, as I track it back, it usually does have to do something within their previous, you know, uh, period in their lifetimes. Um, I don't see any questions. Brian, do you have any questions? Brian, are you? I know you're with us. Maybe I'm mute. 
Oh, he is on mute. Uh, just one moment. Any questions, Brian? You good? That's good. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this anecdote for everybody. And I think this is a great anecdote to, for everybody. If I had a gentleman years and years ago that developed hallucinations and he was in a very fortunate living situation. His house was in the middle of two other houses. His two houses on both sides were his two kids' houses. Okay. So imagine you were living by yourself. He and his wife lived in one house. And then the neighbors, both neighbors were one of his, one was his son and his family and his daughter and her husband and kids. So the backyards were open. So the kids could go back and forth. So he would often tell me, he's like, you know, I see kids in the backyard. And his family members would bring him his son or daughter. And they'd say, yeah, our kids do play in the backyard. Mm -hmm. After a little while, he kept saying, you know, I don't know if the kids are going to school. They're in the backyard a lot. And both sets of children looked at each other and said, no, the kids are in school. And we started wondering whose kids they were. Very plausible, right? Very right. realistic. Very plausible. Sees kids, experiences kids. After a little while, what happened to him was his, his spouse passed away. Rather suddenly passed away. He, even though he was living right next to both his children, they would check in on him regularly. The first time, and he was having a little, little hallucinations. The first time he had really a significant turn in his hallucinations, he saw not children anymore, but teenagers trying to come into the house and breaking down the house door. Oh, yeah. You can imagine this gentleman was found by his family members with a gun in his bedroom, holding a shotgun like this, scared that somebody was coming into the house. Oh, man, yeah. And they found it was odd that they couldn't talk. They, they called him. He didn't pick up the phone. He hadn't been outside yet, and they were wondering. It was a nice summer day, and he hadn't come outside in the backyard yet. They went to check in on grandfather and then they realized, and his, when I say grandfather, his, his kids, some of his grandchildren were in their twenties, just to let you know, they were, they were teenagers to 20 years. Suddenly the little kids had become grown up, become teenagers. And he was hallucinating that teenagers were breaking into his house. Mm -hmm. They were shocked to find out that that had happened. And apparently for a few days prior to that, he had an infection, a UTI, which resulted in that. Even then of worse. course he was done to develop hallucinations, which we treated and managed. Uh, over the course of time but you can see how it can start off from something that's plausible and at some point it takes a right turn into something quite scary so oh, i leave yeah, everybody that's... with that thought that, that even if it's mild bring it up to your healthcare professional and we might tell you it's mild keep an eye on it if this happens follow the following things it's important to have that guidance so, so well take I, care you know, i'm glad you brought that up about the utis because that's another thing just in uh, uh if i'm speaking correctly it seems like the elderly population in general when they mm -hmm. have a UTI, confusion can set in. They can get kind of scary and hallucinations, delusions. So um, I can only imagine that it's quantum if they already experience that without a UTI. So right. really a lot of, there are a lot of factors here to consider. But doctor, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Any, any other words of wisdom you'd like to share before we sign off? No, but I think, I think and, uh, please have discussions between spouses and caregivers and your healthcare professionals. I think that's incredibly important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, listen, thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. Everybody who's watching Barbara. Thank you. I'll see you in Las Vegas for the conference. And yes, I'm caught up on Yellowstone. I love it. And uh, Brian, thank you, my friend. I know you're out there right behind me. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. And I hope to see you again soon. Have a great absolutely. day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Brian. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. I know you're getting snow tonight. Yeah, we're going to get some snow. All right, <laughs> doctor. Take care now. Thanks Take care. Bye-bye.